Welcome to Leaders Recon, where we will be discussing leadership, warrior skills, and other opportunities within the G3 Leader Development Branch. I'm your host, Joshua Carr, and today we will be discussing state active duty with Brigadier General Janine Burkhead. General Burkhead, welcome to the program. For those in the audience who might not know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, ma'am? Sure. Um, glad to be here with you today uh, to talk about leadership. And I am the Assistant Adjutant General for the Maryland Army National Guard. And you may also hear the term Army Commander. And those are synonymous here in Maryland. Uh, I serve in both capacities. And in that role, I command approximately 4,500 soldiers um, across different um, fields and MOSs. We have, for instance, here in Maryland, we have the Expeditionary Military Intelligence Brigade to um, a truck and water. And um, so we, we have the gamut here and to military police. I want to mention that. So um, as a commander of those troops, I am the force provider should we need to deploy uh, overseas to fight wars or here in the state of Maryland, should we need to cover down on um, disasters, natural or man-made in support of the governor. So kind of going back into your history a little bit, what made you initially want to join the military? So it's a, it's a kind of funny story. It was really a challenge from my mother who knows that I love a challenge. And he said, oh, sure, Janine, um, there's this ROTC scholarship. But I'm sure you won't get it, but you should apply because I'm sure you won't get it. So there you go. She threw down the gauntlet and I, and I said, okay, sure, I can get that. So um, I proceeded to go through the wickets to apply for an ROTC scholarship. And I think it's important to note that that wasn't something that was on my radar at all. Uh, so when that came to my attention and she threw down the gauntlet, I tried and, and I got it. I succeeded in getting that four-year ROTC scholarship. And so that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship with the Army. Um, uh, from there, uh, I decided that um, it would be best for me to pursue a reserve commission or a commission that would allow me to pursue a civilian career at the same time. I actually had a job lined up to work on Capitol Hill. And at the time, I thought it was perfect that I could pursue that career at the same time and serve my country. So when I graduated from Hampton University four years later, uh, I was pretty set. And I think that's a key to young leaders is to you know, have a plan, always know the plan is going to change, but have some idea of where you want to go. And for me, that plan actually worked out. So then kind of touching on that as a guardsman, I, I feel your kindred spirit there. I spent a couple of years working in the political arena as well. Um, did you maintain a, a career then both on the civilian side and within the guard? Or are you full-time guard now? Or what does that look like for you? Yes, I did. I have been a federal employee after leaving the Hill. Uh, one thing that the guard gave me, of course, I've got the security clearance was a big key, but it allowed me to be really flexible and do different jobs across the um, across the government. So my background goes from being in equal employment opportunity and civil rights to uh, being a special agent in charge at the Defense Security Service, um, then to working back in civil rights at the Office of Personnel Management. And now I work for the Department of Interior for the Special Trustee for American Indian as a senior advisor to the Special Trustee. So uh, my career has been really diverse, I believe, on the civilian side. The key to that has been a lot of the military schools and opportunities I've had. So uh, that's been a great resume builder. Wow. So it sounds like you've done quite a lot then um, on the, both the civilian and the military side of things. Um, Kind of as we, as we dive into the state active duty piece of it here and some of those questions, I know there's been a lot of misinformation um, out there anytime the National Guard gets activated. For those of, uh, in our audience who are unsure what state active duty is, can you kind of explain that a little bit and what that looks like? Yes. So under our role as the, in state active duty or SAD, the acronym SAD, uh, we serve at, yeah, SAD, we serve... Um, the at the governor's um, call and right now we have and have had we've searched and uh, up to 2100 soldiers and airmen uh, for this COVID virus virus response so 
for the COVID-19 response around 2,100 soldiers and airmen on and off um, to support that mission. And so we, um, I can't make this more clear, is that we are here to serve and serve as partners to our state and local and federal partners. We have served beside them. Uh, we understand capacity, and that's what we're here to do, only be a force multiplier. We are not here to um, be a, a military state, and I know that's some concern to people, so I want to absolutely assure um, the public that that's not what we're here for. Uh, in fact, uh, our soldiers have been on the streets of Baltimore most recently, helping at food banks, um, serving local people, uh, doing what we can to assure the, the citizens that, um, for instance, that, that food is not a shortage and, and there's food out there and people willing to help. And uh, another mission that we'll be doing in, the, in this sad SAD state active duty role is that we'll be helping to set up um, testing stations when those go hot and uh, when those are ready to roll out. So those are some of the things that we're doing on state active duty. So you kind of touched on some of these things like what the soldiers are doing. I'd heard that a little bit about uh handing out some of the food and whatnot and some of those tasks. Uh, can you dive in at all into what some of the uh, other units are being tasked with within, you know, under those governor's priorities there in Maryland? So um, a good news story for me, I think, is that our chaplains corps have been so instrumental in getting out into our communities and assuring people. So I'd like to mention the chaplains corps. Um, we've been um, really using them a lot. Then we have our medical uh, community. We have two medical units. They have been on the front lines with working with the state, working with the health department, working with the different partners in Maryland. We have incredible medical facilities here, partnering with um, the Maryland uh, University of Maryland and with the Johns Hopkins. So we have our doctors and our medical professionals on the front lines providing advice and making suggestions on how to plan some of the areas that we plan to use as either screening uh, locations or uh, testing locations. And we have them, uh, those people on the ground every day. Then we have our, our LNOs uh, partnered with state police, Baltimore City Police, Baltimore County Police, and other jurisdictions. Uh, again, not, not doing police work, but finding out where can we actually assist the communities and where can we help? So we have LNOs uh, across the state out there working with the communities. Uh, we also have our military police, again, not doing that traditional military mission that you would think of in a police mission, but actually serving as, um, as that, that, that force to route people to the right direction and to help. And um, good news story, uh, you will find in one of our pictures out there, we've got some of our soldiers helping someone change a tire. So that's the kind of thing that we're out there doing right now. Yeah. So ma'am, you mentioned uh, the role as a commander. Can you explain what a dual status commander is? So the dual status commander was identified in the Defense Authorization Act in December 2011. And the dual status commander allows for a soldier to command both active and reserve and National Guard uh, during a crisis. And um, the dual status commander uh, has Title 10 forces under them and both uh, reserve and National Guard. In essence, that's the point of the dual status commander, so that you have that one touch point who's able to command all those forces operationally on the ground. We have been identified as one of the states to have a dual status commander in Maryland, and I have been identified as that, as that dual status commander and the um, as soon as we get Title 10 forces on the ground, then that, that dual status commander will kick in. So prepare, preparing for state active duty, uh, from a, um, a leadership standpoint, you've got to trust your soldiers and you've got to trust your leadership. It's a two-way street. Uh, the, the only way to uh, move at the speed of trust is to work together prior to any um, crisis happening. And, and so, I would say that we have to get to know each other, making sure that you're working together, you're running through those things that might come up, whether it's a convoy or whether it, it's um, making sure you understand how to do the military decision-making process, or if it's uh, simply um, making sure that your equipment is ready to go. 
all those types of things, uh, causes and lends itself to cohesion because leaders and soldiers on the front lines are doing those together day to day. And if you do that, when we come to crises, we're able to react and move at the speed of trust. I, um, you know, I'm a, a, a Franklin Covey person, probably have most of his books and moving at the speed of trust really, really, really is key to me because once you get to that, being able to move at the speed of trust, then you don't have those glitches in your system. We talk about, um, you know, mission command. That's, that's simply a takeoff of the mission command concept, being able to get out there and to conduct those missions without wondering what do I do next. And so that sort of efficiency is what can be gained when we practice for state active duty early on. And really in Maryland, all the things that we do, um, whether it's medical or whether it's MPs or whether it's our, um, our trucks, we are, we are preparing all the time for our federal mission and state mission. They are so um, entwined that sometimes you, you, don't, you don't really know the difference is training. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that you were talking a little bit about trust there and building that trust. What are some of the effects you've seen? You know, obviously, with the military uh, focus, if you, I mean, if you think about it, like on crisis management on a whole, whether that's on the battlefield or or offhand, um, especially within those medical teams and stuff, providing that assistance to local communities. What's some of the reception and uh, relationships that you've seen being built there, um, just in this short time? Yes. So um, key key to that, I think in this short time, we've certainly developed and solidified those relationships. I mentioned the University of Maryland, but um, key to that, I have to give a shout out to our 70th uh, training regiment because we've been developing those relationships all along. I know other states have the 68 Whiskey Medical Community, and we've reviewed um, whether it's the, the University of Maryland or um, or Johns Hopkins, we've partnered with them all along to, to develop those skills in other areas. So um, that is not a something that's really new to us, but those relationships continue to build. The trust is continued to build. Um, they know our capabilities and, um, and we're looking forward to working together to um, stem the COVID crisis. It's um, something that uh, here in Maryland, as I said, with the communities that we have, the medical communities, I, I, I'm certainly um, hopeful and certain that they can meet the crisis challenge. So you, you talked a little bit about um, some of the preparedness uh, that's happened, you know, whether, whether a lot of the training that the Guard does is simultaneous, like it's ap- applicable both to the war fight and to... Um, these missions on the homeland. What do, what are some of the things that um, young leaders can do to help ensure soldier readiness as a whole? So uh, to ensure soldier readiness as a whole, uh, I, I've got to go back to and give a nod to physical fitness, of course, because uh, my sergeant major would be um, would be upset if I didn't mention that. So certainly physical fitness. And in this time of, um, of crises, physical fitness is important just as well as mental fitness. And one of the things that um, I, I really have to, to say is that soldiers have to be resilient. And resiliency at this time in particular is very important. So uh, I mentioned the, the chaplaincy earlier. I think it's that triad. You've got chaplaincy, you've got the uh, physical fitness, and then you've got your mental fitness are certainly important to being prepared for young soldiers. And then that soldiers have to be able to depend on their leadership to take them in the right direction. So that goes back to that trust and moving at the speed of trust and having worked together before to understand that your your leadership is competent and able to carry you in the right direction to success. And then if you're prepared from from an educational standpoint, so we could do all the things right. You could be the best soldier, have the perfect PT test. and um, But if you cannot and you do not get the education, then, then you're going nowhere. So that's a, a piece that we always have to be mindful of. And I know that trips up, whether it's uh, soldiers, officers, or enlisted. Um, that's sometimes a big stumbling block, particularly for a traditional guards person or, or reservist, is to make sure you get that military education in while having a family and while having a civilian job. But it's really important to do that. Uh, I am, I've been identified and appointed as a 
uh, dual headed position as the deputy commanding general at the Army War College for Reserve Affairs. And it is um, it is heartening to see the numbers of reservists that we have going through the War College and who are doing it all simultaneously, having a job, family, and then doing their military education. So I will say to young, young officers, you can do it. You can get there. Um, As we focus in on the leadership side of things a little bit, um, over the course of your career, you've done a number of different things. Um, what are some resources that really have helped you um, develop as a leader over time to uh, the position to where you're at today? So in short, I'm going to say that's people, places, and things. So I'll start with people. You have to have a mentor, and, and we say that all the time, and it becomes cliche, but it really is important to identify someone who um, you mesh with and who you can talk to and who you can bounce ideas off and then who can help lead. And um, it's always a good idea, in my opinion, to have more than one mentor. So you want to have that person who maybe knows your career and knows that career path, person who's telling you that, hey, uh, Janine, you might want to tone this down or, or you might want to work on this skill and identify those weaknesses. Uh, so people are important. And uh, in my career, I've had some really great mentors, and I always like to give a shout out to Lieutenant General, um, retired and now deceased, former Adjutant General from Maryland, and that would be James F. Frederick, who was a big part of my life. And General Frederick, at a time when it wasn't, um, diversity was not thought of in the terms that we think of it today, said, I want that woman to be my aide. And so I was his aide. Um, his aide when I was lieutenant. And that really set me on a path for success, being able to have those opportunities to see um, soldiers and leaders at work. So probably one of the most important things uh, when developing a relationship would be to make sure you're treating your soldiers well, uh, making sure that during the development of our relationship that uh, understanding that we're all people, and you have to be mindful of that uh, when you're considering what soldiers have going on in their own lives. So treating people well, um, regardless of um, their ability to perform at your expectations, I think are very, is very important. So that, that would say that's people. And then uh, during ROTC, uh, the Reserve Officers Training Program at Hampton University, I had some key people instrumental in helping me be successful there. Uh, you know, four, four years of ROTC isn't easy for anyone. It's a commitment. And um, certainly I wanted to give up at times, but I had people there who were, no, you can do it, Janine, you can do it. And then um, once I'm here on the other side, you know, I look and I look at General Singh, Linda Singh, the uh, 29th Adjutant General for Maryland who recently retired. And she's definitely been a mentor to me. Um, supportive and someone I look up to and continue to look up to as a role model. Uh, I followed her in command at the company, but high in the brigade levels, and then um, as the assistant adjutant general. So she she was successful in, in instilling something in me. I listened. So that's people. Um, places, uh, I would say that you've got to get out there and and know your community community, but in the Army, the bigger Army community. So across the gamut and across the world, I have people that I call friend or people I can call on, and you have to have a deep Rolodex to be successful. So go places, get out of your comfort zone, uh, meet people, and um, that will be uh, big to success. And then when I say things, I'm talking about things like this. You have got to read. You've got to read and you've got to be uh, a subject matter expert in our field, and that's the field of war, combat, and leadership. So, and it's not just one type of reading, it's several types of things that you would, um, I would recommend that you would read and, um, and take away things from that reading that will allow you to be successful and to build your own, um, your own skill, set, skill set and repertoire. So you kind of touched on this a little bit, but we ask all of our guests um, that come on the on the podcast here if there was one uh, piece of advice that they would give to you know young soldiers or upcoming leaders. What would it be? I would say to trust yourself. Uh, make sure that you 
um, are confident and take control of a situation, when you, it's going to arise, you're going to be challenged and you're going to have to make a decision. Right or wrong, know that your leaders at the higher level support you. They'll take the risk on, but you make a decision and you go forward. Don't hesitate. General Burkhead, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your experience. Absolutely. Thank you. Tune in to Leaders Recon over the next few weeks as we bring in leaders and pioneers to discuss their experiences, share their wisdom, and to help you grow as a leader. We will also be announcing opportunities to sharpen your skills and experiences as leaders in today's Army National Guard. See you next time. If you like this episode of Leaders Recon, don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.